Hello everybody, my name is Kat Bowser. I'm your resident fantasy therapist. Welcome to my channel. Those of you who are returning, welcome back. Those of you who are here for the first time, welcome. My name is Kat Bowser. I am a licensed therapist. I am also an author working on my first novel. And on my channel, I like to dig into writing through a psychological viewpoint. So we'll be looking at characters, plot, tropes, world building and everything that falls in between those topics all with a psychological angle and the reason I do that is one being a therapist I kind of that's how I think um, but secondly I think it helps to make your characters and your plot in your world more realistic and more well-rounded so for today we are continuing with a series I have started which is what I call my trope diagnosis series, which is where I take a popular character or plot trope and I talk about the psychology behind it and ways that we can use it in our writing. So last month, all the tropes were centered on villains because of the Halloween holiday. So um, last week I did my very last villain one that from uh, one that I'd left out and by recommendation. So today for this month of November and maybe the first through the first week in December, just to make it all even. I wanted to talk about sidekicks, sidekick tropes. These can either be the literal sidekick to the hero, or it can be the collection of folks that are around the hero, the um, what we call the family team, so to speak. Um, and the reason I want to talk about this is because I think the sidekicks or the side characters um, or what I sometimes, I sometimes call them junior heroes because a lot of times they're more important than a secondary character, but they're not quite a hero. So I call them a junior hero. It makes more sense to me. Anyway, the reason I think these are important is they serve a very specific purpose and what purpose they serve depends on what type of sidekick they are. Um, I personally grew up in the 80s and 90s and Every single cartoon had a bunch of side characters, team characters, and I think that's where my love of them came from. So, that being said, let's start with, honestly, this is probably one of my favorite tropes on sidekicks, and that's the kid sidekick. First and foremost, this is one of those tropes that usually you either love it or you hate it. Um, and if you hate the kid sidekick, I totally get why. I, I really do. Um, this can be done very well, but it can also be done horribly. <laughs> um, so I want to talk a little bit about what are what, what are the things I think that are important to include and what you can do to make it done well. So first and foremost, um, the kid protag the, the protagonist, the, See, I'm thinking on my, on my novel right now, which has kid protagonist. Anyway, the kid sidekick really is created to fulfill one of two functions. The first is to give the hero someone to talk to. Um, this is actually something that you notice in the early comics, and that's actually one reason that they created characters like Robin, for instance, in the Batman comics, is because they had a lot of um, internal monologue that Batman was having to go through, but he was having to talk to himself to let the audience know what was going on. So if you introduce a character that he has tagging along that he can talk to, then that kind of fulfills that purpose. And that was originally a purpose, I believe, of Watson in the original Sherlock Holmes stories was to fulfill that purpose. He was supposed to be essentially an audience member plugged into the story that Holmes could talk to. Um, second purpose that a kid sidekick fulfills, widen in your audience. I mean, um, let's, let's not uh, joke ourselves here. A lot of times, especially in kid shows, they are introduced to pull kids in. Um, one of my favorite examples is actually the early 2000s, there was a CGI cartoon called Reboot, and I still love it, I still recommend it. Um, but the creators originally did not want to have a kid character because they thought that a kid character was very pretentious, it would get in the way, and 
they, they just really didn't see a reason to have him there. But the studio that they were working with said, no, if you're, if you're making this cartoon for kids, there has to be a kid character. So they made one. And what's interesting is that they originally, like I said, just put him in because the network says you got to have a kid character. But as the series went on, um, they started to really develop his personality and his character. He became a main character in the second season. They aged him up in season three. And by the end of season three, they liked it. They liked him so much, but they liked the younger version of him. And they found a way to bring the younger version back. So I always thought that was very interesting. Um, now, I, on the one hand, I don't completely agree with this angle because... I don't necessarily think you have to have a kid character to pull in a younger audience, but sometimes it does pull in um, a younger audience. So it's one of those where I look at it as more, it can help, but it's not necessary kind of thing. Anyway, having said that, so if we're talking about kid sidekicks, the term kid is very vague. <laughs> And I think it's very vague for a reason, um, because usually with these kind of characters, they're usually nowadays, they're more in their teenage years, um, you know, 14, 15, 16. That wasn't always the case. Um, Robin is generally considered to be the first kid sidekick that was created. And when he was first introduced, he was eight years old. Um, and then you had um, other comics that would follow the trend so like then kid flash was introduced he was nine years old um i believe speedy um sidekick to green arrow was introduced i think he was 10 or 11. so they used to be much younger and i think really what has happened is that when these characters were introduced the comics weren't doing a lot of super dark stuff um it was like the it was like the batman 1960s kind of um adventures that they were going on so you would have the occasional darker adventure but for the most part they were more lighthearted. as the adventures and ideas got darker and heavier the sidekicks aged up um which makes sense there's generally a uh, we don't like to put little kids in dire straits generally um which I don't think I need to explain why we don't like to do that. <laughs> but in regards to using it in a story, I think the first thing you have to decide is how old is said kid character? Are you going to go for the older teenage years? Or are you going to go for younger? Do I think it has to be a teenager to put them through some of the nasty stuff that comes with fantasy, horror, and all that stuff? No. No, in fact, I think it can be interesting if it's the other way around, if it's a younger child having to deal with this. But that all depends on how you write it. Um, the difficulty with doing a kid sidekick is inevitably somebody is going to ask you, why is the hero letting this happen? <laughs> and to be fair, that is a legit complaint. That is a legit question. Um, so I think in most cases, um, they kind of avoid the question usually, um, which I understand why they do it, but it's not very realistic because let's be frank, if you ran into a hero in real life that had like a seven or eight year old trailing along with them on all these adventures, the very first thing you would do is, okay, why are you, why are you bringing this kid with you? <laughs> um, so if you want to approach it in a realistic fashion, um, I think Darkwing Duck does it very well in that um, Goslin, who is supposed to be, God, how old? I think she's nine. I believe she's nine, if memory serves me right. And her father, Darkwing Duck, or Drake Mallard, actually s tries to keep her out of his adventures for this reason, because he does all these dangerous and horrible things. So he tries to leave, he will leave her behind. He will tell her not to come with him. And she comes anyway, and she follows him. Um, and he does give her punishments for when she does this, but she keeps doing it. So 
in that case, I think their approach they use works very well in that he has tried to keep her out of the action. He has tried punishments and rewards to keep her out of the action, and she is just, she's not having it. So in that case, he kind of reaches this point where it's like, okay, she's going to follow me anyway. I'm still going to tell her to stay home, but she's going to follow me anyway. So if she's going to do that, I might as well train her and teach her how to take care of herself. That's legit. That's fine. Um, I think the other scenario where it works is if you have a set of heroes who are essentially in a survival situation. Um, and when you're in a survival situation, you don't really have a lot of um, choice in incorporating the kids because most of the time it's either I got to I got to teach these kids how to fight or how to survive or they're not going to make it. What if I'm not there, you know? those kind of situations. Um, those are ones that I saw a lot in like the eighties cartoons, like, um, the original Thundercats cartoon, actually my two favorite characters were the kids sidekicks. Give you go figure. And they were supposed to be about 11 or 12. Um, but they were considered a full part of the team because they were in this survival situation where you really couldn't afford to keep them out of the action. Um, and that actually leads into my next point about kid sidekicks that I think is really fun to use. And that is kids do not think like adults. Kids are developmentally very different. Um, and there is a division between um, how kids think and how their morale, m morality processes, depending on how old they are. So generally 12 or 13 to like 17, we consider one developmental stage, usually about 6 to 11, 12-ish is another. Um, but the point I want to bring up here is that kids are very creative creatures. And I think that is something that is not utilized nearly as much as it should be in stories. Um, usually if there's a kid character, they're there to kind of provide some humor and be a little annoying, but they're usually mirroring what the adults are saying. That's not quite how it works. I have nephews, okay? I have my two sister's sons, my sister's children. Um, one of them is six, and one of them is going to be five um, next month. These guys, I... I don't know how their thought process works, and I've studied it. <laughs> I still don't get it. Um, because little kids are not confined by how they think they should think, for lack of a better word. Um, for example, my husband works with um, all different age groups, um, teaching them, and he's done camps and things like that. And they do something called, I'm going to say this wrong, um, the, I think it's the, the Royal Goldberg machine. Like I said, I know I'm, I know I'm saying that wrong, so feel free to protect me, correct me if you want. Um, which is essentially you set up a series of reactions that produces an end element. Like, for example, popping a balloon or um, blowing up a balloon or something like that. And the idea is to use things in ways that they're not normally used. Now, you might think that a group of older kids would do better because they know they know more, they know more how reactions work. Not true. Not true at all. The best group that does the best with this project, kindergartners and first graders. Because they are extremely creative and they are not afraid to try things that to us make no darn sense. Um, and sometimes it pays off for them. That I think is what's missing with a lot of these kid sidekicks that I would love to see more is just that boundless creativity. Because there's ways that these kids can think to get them out of a situation that an adult would never think of. And it's not because an adult wouldn't be trying, but it's as we grow older, especially as we go through our education system, we're kind of trained to think in a certain way. You know, we're trained to think, okay, this item is used for X, Y, and Z. But when we're a kid, we don't have those restraints. 
And that's something I want to see more with good sidekicks. I think that adds a lot of weight to their purpose is just that they're able to think of situations and solutions that the hero doesn't think of. Uh, second, I kind of brought this up briefly. They, they are there to add a little bit of humor. Um, I mean, let's face it, most of the time kids are funny. Uh, <laughs> um, one of my favorite characters in my work in progress right now is a secondary character, Tony. He's one of my favorites because he is so blunt. He is so blunt. Um, he isn't afraid to tell you off. He isn't afraid to tell you that he thinks you're an idiot. And that can make for some really fun scenes, especially if you're contrasting it with someone who cares very much about their image and then you have someone who really doesn't give a shit. <laughs> um, those kind of contrasts are always fun. But I think that's where kid characters kind of get stuck, is that people use them strictly for humor. And I don't think that's a good idea. Um, for one, I think it, kind of like with any character, if you usually use them strictly for one purpose, um, it gets old, it gets stale, and it doesn't feel well fleshed out. Um, if I have a character and the only thing they're ever doing is humor, they, they either better be a one-shot character where they show up once and they go away, or I'm going to be wondering what's wrong with this character <laughs> because you have more to your, to your personality than just that one trait. But unfortunately, the kid characters get shoved into this um, mold. And that's one reason I think I like the kid characters when they're part of a team because when they're part of a team, they usually have to have more purpose than just being funny. Um, like um, I'll reference uh, the Thundercats cartoon again because that's one I grew up with and I really liked a lot. And I, st I still like it. It's cheesy, but I like it. Um, the fact that the two kid characters, their whole big trait, their main, um, their main strength is their cunning, is their ability to be tricky and their agility. And I think that works really well. There's still scenarios where they're funny and they're and they're goofy kids, but there's also situations where, especially if they realize that things are getting serious, that goofiness goes away. It's like, okay, now now I need to focus. I need to be a equal member of this team. And I like that. Uh, other thing to consider is kid characters, you can really grow them. And I mean that both figuratively and literally. If you're doing a series and you start off a kid at eight and you end a series and they're like 15, you have a lot of room to grow them. And I think that's something they did actually very well with most of the kid sidekicks in like the comics. Um, Robin, I think, is the best example. The first Robin, um, Dick Grayson, we first meet him, he's eight. And then when he grows into Nightwing and he has his own comics. Um, and as he grows, he keeps a lot of the traits that we're introduced to him with, but we also see them grow into adult traits. Um, one of the things is, for example, um, Batman poured so much training into this kid. I mean, I think this kid speaks like 10 languages now. Um, taught him detective skills, all this stuff. But because of his personality, when he was a kid, he also has leadership skills and communication skills that Batman does not have. So that's why a lot of times people refer to him as better than Batman. And that's because he has all the skills Batman has plus people skills. <laughs> that's just one example. Um, you could look at, um, for example, Kid Flash is another good example. Um, starts off as just um, the nephew of Flash's uh, girlfriend slash fiance slash wife. And then he grows with the Flash as his father figure, essentially, and develops his own personality. And he probably changes the most from when he was a kid, um, but he still keeps the traits that were ingrained in him as a, as a kid. And we see it grow and change and evolve as he grows. And I always think that's interesting. But the most interesting thing about a kid sidekick to me is that most of the time, I think their best role is they are essentially the hero's moral compass. Um, I've also heard it referred to as a morality pet. <laughs> um, 
best way I think it would describe it is if I was going to use, for example, the Batman um, scenario. Robin keeps Batman human. And by that, I mean he reminds him of why he does what he does. Um, a lot of times with heroes, it's easy for them to kind of, what I would call kind of fall into the abyss, get kind of overwhelmed by all the things they have to deal with. And if you have a kid character with them, it kind of keeps them from slipping into that abyss. So it keeps them grounded. And I think that is a really interesting way for, to give them purpose is that they're there not just their personality or their interactions but just their presence alone serves as a grounding tool and i like that um i think it works best when it's both their personality and their presence together that keep the hero grounded i think that really is the best combo because then they aren't just a token quote unquote morality pet. They are an individual that the hero cares about and cares about keeping safe. And so they're going to do what they can to protect them. And in the process, they protect and better themselves. That's great. Um, anything that, that has the hero really striving to improve on themselves, I'm all for. The other thing is Naturally, this falls into that um, trope of where the villain can use your loved one. I'm not against that trope, honestly. Um, I think it can definitely be overused like any trope. Um, I'll go into that at a later video because that's a whole trope video on its own. But I think it's a way that the villain can kind of show off essentially their lack of a moral code in contrast to the hero's moral code. And I think when you have a kid in there, it kind of is a reminder of, okay, this kid and what they represent is why I'm not going to turn into this villain. And I, I don't know, I just think that's a very interesting dynamic. And it creates a scenario for the hero to kind of develop this fatherly or motherly relationship. I, I know I keep referring mainly to, to male figures because um, those are were predominant in comics and movies and stuff. That doesn't mean there aren't females in there. It just means I haven't thought to bring them up. <laughs> um, but regardless, it gives the hero a chance to be a paternal figure, whether, whether it be a motherly figure, fatherly figure, older brother, older sister. And especially with a lot of heroes, they don't usually have a lot of family left. And so this is their chance to essentially create their own family. And anybody that knows my writing knows I love that kind of stuff. I love it when we can form our own families, form our own bonding. And that, to me, that is a great step in making your characters relatable and making them entertaining. And at the same time, building empathy with your reader because most of the time, we, we were all children at some point. So if we're introduced, even if it's not necessarily the main character, if we're introduced to a kid character who is accepted by the hero for whatever reason, we remember what it was like to be accepted when we were a kid. And that has a strong impact on, okay, I like this hero. I, I, like, I like how he is being accepting and listening or whatever you want to use. So that for me is all the numerous reasons I really like the kid sidekick. Now, like I said at the beginning though, can it be done horribly? Absolutely. And when it's done horribly, unfortunately, I think that's when it's broadcast. When you have a really bad kid sidekick, everybody talks about it. Like, oh, this kid's horrible. This kid's this, this kid's that. Not denying that the kid's sidekick can't be horrible. They absolutely can. But they can also be wonderful additions. And I think we need to play with it a little more. So guys, that was our trope video for this week. Thank you guys for chiming in and checking it out with me. 
As always, if you guys like this content, make sure you leave comments below and make sure to subscribe and ring that bell so you don't miss when I upload. Um, I upload every Thursday and every Sunday, and I will throw you guys a few extra videos when I can. And until next time, I hope you guys have a great day.